How do you like it? I think we should discuss The Shining. I think we should discuss what it's about. I think maybe you should get off the internet. When do you think maybe I should get off the internet? As soon as possible? As soon as possible? I've had my whole fucking life to use my brain and think rationally. What good's a couple more minutes gonna do me now? Whoa. Maybe I should get off the internet. Start to talk like a crazy person. saw The Shining at around the age of 13 under what were probably the worst circumstances under which to view a film for the first time. I had been surfing the three or four channels we actually had available and had come across this scene. I didn't know why this crazy guy was trying to get into the bathroom to kill his family, though I did recognize that it was The Shining. I'd seen the trailers for it before and they'd kind of given me the heebie-jeebies, but I found I couldn't take my eyes off the thing. I'd come in at around the two hour mark. Uh, like I said, not the most ideal way to see a film for the first time, but I desperately wanted to know what had led up to this ending, so I made a point to keep an eye out for re-airings because I desperately wanted to see it from the beginning. I saw it many, many times since then, and it's become one of my favorite films. I sought out the novel by Stephen King and found a version of the story with similar bones, but which was different in almost every detail. And of course, there was that made-for-TV miniseries that came out in 97, but no one really ever talks about that one. Well, that sounds fine to me. A lot of people talked about this film over the years, and as the internet grew in prominence, I slowly came to realize that a lot of those people had what I shall charitably call batshit insane ideas about this movie. I'd never found the film confusing. Recovering alcoholic Jack Torrance takes a job as a winter caretaker at a mountain resort and brings along his wife and son Danny, who has odd premonitions of evil at the place. The ghosts of the hotel's past tragedies start to make Jack unravel, and losing himself to its malign influence he tries to kill his family as a prior caretaker had done years earlier. Simple. Yet there were all manner of attempts at explaining things that didn't really need explaining going on, such as the ball that rolls towards Danny is yellow, and Danny is sitting on a patch of red carpet, and yellow and red make orange, and in the book, when Dick Halloran experiences the shining, he smells oranges, so this explains who rolled the ball to Danny, and I wish I was making that up, but I'm not. Yes, someone actually thought that rambling barf bag of pattern recognition on shrooms constituted an explanation. This is not to say, however, that there are no oddities to be found in the film. There definitely are. However, there's a good test of fan theories in these sorts of instances. If the theory takes something confusing and makes it clearer, it might be onto something. If it takes something confusing or worse, something not confusing, and makes it harder to understand or provokes more questions than an answers, it's apt to be wrong. One of the most contentious issues surrounding the film is the question of whether or not it is depicting a haunting or a gradual collapse of the protagonist's sanity. This is on the saner end of the multitudinous theories regarding the film, as there is a long history of rather ambiguous haunting stories out there, from The Haunting of Hill House, to The Turn of the Screw, to the recent David Bruckner film The Night House, all of which could be interpreted as having no actual ghosts in their narratives. This isn't an unreasonable speculation due to Kubrick's subtlety in the film. Consider Jack 
Jack's first interaction with Lloyd the bartender. As depicted, this could be read multiple ways. Perhaps Jack is simply imagining a conversation with a sympathetic listener and venting his frustrations. Perhaps he's starting to lose his marbles and actually thinks there's a bartender there for real, or maybe it's a ghost. In the case of The Shining, I suggest it isn't an either-or situation at all. King's book is very clear on the subject, at least in its final act. The Overlook is haunted, and Jack is cracking under its oppressive nature. While the book and film differ in many details, the broad strokes are all the same, save perhaps for Jack's nature, which the film depicts as much more hostile. Adapting a book about a haunted hotel into a movie about a non-haunted hotel feels like several steps too far, much more significant than, say, the issue of whether or not the hotel is still standing at the end, or if it burns down as it did in King's novel. That's not something fundamental to the narrative, whereas the issue of a real versus imagined haunting is rather important. Proponents of this theory often cite Kubrick's own disbelief in the afterlife as a reason why he would possibly choose not to make the haunting literal, overlooking the fact that he hired novelist Diane Johnson to help with the script for that exact reason. Furthermore, Kubrick himself said that the supernatural elements of the film were real in an interview with French film critic Michael Simon. While there's a school of thought out there that maintains that the author's ideas about his creation are irrelevant if they aren't presented in the work itself, in Kubrick's mind they were in the film. The scene where Grady released is Jack from the pantry was meant to be the scene that answered the question of are there or are there not ghosts, with Kubrick stating that the scene left no other explanation but the supernatural. He goes on to say, in response to a question about the possibility that it's all in Jack's head, that for the purposes of telling the story, my view is that the paranormal is genuine. Even if your theory works around this somehow, the fact is it's not what the director intended and advancing an alternate explanation to circumvent the director's wishes feels a trifle desperate. I don't believe in ghosts either, but I also don't believe in elves, which doesn't stop me from enjoying Lord of the Rings. And let's face it, The Shining itself is a sort of ESP telepathy combo sort of ability, so it's not as if removing the ghost from the equation suddenly grounds the film in reality. However, from here things only get weirder, such as the notion that the film makes total sense if you go from the perspective that Wendy was the actual abuser, and that anytime she sees something that seems to contradict that, it's her imagination. I mean, Wendy says Jack hurt Danny. He injured Danny's arm. And Jack says Jack hurt Danny. I did hurt him once, okay? But despite all evidence to the contrary, everyone knows. The underpinning of this particular theory is born almost entirely out of a desire to reconcile continuity breaks in the editing. First by citing this chair that disappears in the second iteration of this angle, but returns for the third, and then the appearance of a piece of paper in the typewriter after we see Jack rip out the one he'd been typing on. This is sufficient to convince the proponent of this theory that Wendy has therefore hallucinated the entire scene along with any other scenes that portray Jack as being the threat or aggressor, including scenes where Wendy isn't even present. He also references a deleted scene at the end of the script wherein the hotel manager tells Wendy that the police found no evidence of the strange things she saw at the hotel, implying she imagined it. The creator of this theory also suggests that the camera's position behind the subject is indicative of a hallucinatory sequence, really without any justification, as this isn't Wendy's point of view at all. It's the exact opposite of her point of view. The notion is that the continuity breaks can all be explained in this way, except, as I've already pointed out, Wendy isn't even in many of the shots in question. Here this large piece of driftwood is seen atop this table, but here it's missing. Wendy isn't there in either scene. This is not what hallucination means. If you look down and see the carpet moving about in a weird way, that's a hallucination. However, if you have some elaborate notion that outside the hotel, where you can't even see, there's a horde of zombies running around, that's a delusion. Movies and books get the details of mental problems wrong all the time, so this doesn't necessarily debunk the idea, but what are we to make of the famous scene where Jack encounters the image of a dead woman approaching from a bathtub. The theory tries to suggest Wendy was the one who was in the room and attacked Danny because of this dissolve to her in the basement, but what are we to make of Jack's experience, which concludes with him returning to the room and telling her he saw no, nothing. Nothing at all. If she imagined the whole event, wouldn't she know he was lying? It all happened in her head, so why doesn't she dispute his account? Now, he doesn't mention this dissolve, which could equally imply that all the other characters are in Halloran's head, so how do we know which dissolves are clues and which are just scene transitions? The practical answer is, of course, does it or does it not help the theory? This is all an incredibly elaborate attempt at maintaining the myth that Stanley Kubrick was a godlike man incapable of error. These things happened in movies all the time. 
time. What in-story explanation accounts for the disappearance of these barrels that Sam and Frodo are leaning against once Faramir enters the room? Of course, Peter Jackson isn't an elevated being like Kubrick, though they do seem to share the same hair, so we can accept that he might make a goof or two. Therefore, I offer into evidence this scene from A Clockwork Orange, where, as Alex plays with this giant butt weenus, the homeowner's cats change from one shot to the next. The white kitty under this table is gone in the second shot, then returns for the third, just like the chair in The Shining. Maybe they went to the same place so Kitty could have a comfy chair. Or take a look at this scene. When Ullman is giving the Torrances a tour of the grounds, they walk straight in front of an oncoming car, which is then gone when the angle shifts. Where did it go? Maybe the same place as this female pedestrian in Eyes Wide Shut, who is just about to walk past Tom Cruise when it cuts into a close-up and suddenly she's nowhere to be seen. And this is a deleted audio track wherein we hear something like, Oh shit! A Scientologist! This also seems to break visual continuity. What about this Russian woman's crossed or uncrossed legs in 2001? What about the fact that two of these women have coats over the backs of their chairs? Until they don't. Who's the coat thief? When Frank Poole exits the pod, he has this replacement part in his right hand, and then in the very next shot he has it in his left hand. Is the monolith causing these discrepancies? The simple fact is that on something as complicated as a film production, errors are inevitable no matter who you are. And by the time most are noticed, i.e. when the film is being edited, the actors have gone home and the sets have been taken down. If Kubrick was alive today, he might well be dabbling in the same sort of obsessive polishing David Fincher is now known for. We're talking about a guy who actually had a persistent gap composited into Rooney Mara's hair for one scene, presumably so he wouldn't see articles proclaiming that Elizabeth's fuck up bangs ruined the girl with the dragon tattoo, written by some modern professional complainer who doubtlessly never attempted something as complex as a feature film before nitpicking the crap out of those who do. In a time when even a nobody like me can add things in post, I can easily imagine Kubrick digitally adding in the hedge maze so these helicopter shots would match, but the option wasn't available to him. He wanted the maze, and he wanted a helicopter establishing shot, and the fact that they weren't exactly compatible was just too bad. And I personally find it ironic that somebody possessed of the notion that that the man could do no wrong would attempt to prove stand aside coming through would attempt to prove their point by referencing a scene that Kubrick clearly chose to remove from the film. Do you not think he took it out for a good reason? Hell, maybe he thought that it implied something along the lines of what your theory is suggesting, and he didn't want that. In fact, he didn't want that scene to count so much that after the cuts were made, he had the footage destroyed. Great theory, isn't it? But surely there must be some other reason for why so many of the furnishings in the Colorado Lounge come and go throughout the film, including this entire couch and table combo right on the other side of the table where Jack is typing up his massive, if rather redundant, opus, right? Well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the set actually burned to the ground during production, necessitating a lengthy pause in shooting while things were rebuilt and possibly not all put back just as they were. I'd wager there weren't piles of identical driftwood sculptures just lying around some Hollywood prop house, for example. Coupled with the constant rewrites and out-of-sequence shooting that occurs in all films, it's not hard to see how this could happen. When everybody's got their script out, you can look right over and know if they've got the latest version. But of course, you but never have the it's amazing what a little applied reason can do in terms of discerning why these things might occur. Consider this scene of Danny playing on the famous carpet. Between the first and second shots, the pattern reverses with the point in the pattern pointing out in front of Danny instead of behind him. People argue that this must have been deliberate considering that rearranging the camera, lights, and crew positions to enable shooting in the reverse direction would be a lengthy process, and I agree. In fact, I think they just answered their own question. Yes, it would be a pain in the ass to move all the equipment and people and lights and everything to the other side of the hall, which is why they didn't do it at all. They just had Danny turn in place. Face this way up the hall, just move the cars to the other side, pull back and suddenly you're in position for the subsequent shot without a lengthy reset time. And after that, they would have had to move the camera to the other side because as Danny stands up, you can see the rest of the hallway behind him. So they just had him stay where he was. Because let's face it, nobody thought anyone would be looking for clues in the carpet pattern. Now, I know some people will resist the notion that Kubrick was a fallible being like the rest of us, but that comes from conflating perfectionism with actually being perfect. The thing about perfection is that it's unknowable. 
Exactly. For Kubrick, performance was extremely important, which is what led to the often outrageous number of takes he would do in pursuit of the perfect delivery, and frankly, even that's been exaggerated in this film's mythology. Even though a high take count can readily contribute to an increase in continuity problems as objects get moved about from shot to shot, he clearly regarded the discrepancy as worth it. What's a flaw to you might be a near irrelevancy to someone whose end goal is something else. This scene uh, slightly drove me crazy because of the continuity. Yeah, Ron Lehman's an amazing actor. He's not Captain of the SS continuity friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so it was tricky to uh, cut his uh, eyeglass his eyeglass acting. But I, I, as I said before, I always choose performance over continuity because uh, I, don't, I don't really care. You also have to remember that at the time this film was made, the home video market was very much in its infancy with only the wealthy even owning VCRs in the first place. The kind of scrutiny we can now devote to a film just wasn't possible back then and probably wasn't considered a factor. What about room 237? Ah, yes. Room 237. Not just the hotel's most haunted room, but the name of a uh, <clears throat> documentary on The Shining released in 2012, which I'm still not certain was meant to be taken seriously. For all I know, the filmmaker invited his commentators to gush their crazy nonsense ad nauseum in order to laugh at them. <laughs> Lord knows I did. So, where do I even start? I suppose I'll address Bill Blakemore's theory first, given it's the least nutty of the bunch. He maintains that the film is an allegory for the genocide of the Indians and has the advantage of the subject actually appearing in the source material. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. It's a fair point to note, given that this detail isn't present in the novel, and there are an abundance of Navajo patterns and motifs used throughout the hotel, which was greatly inspired by the interior detail of the Awani Hotel in Yosemite. His suggestion that the huge gush of blood emerging from the hotel represented the blood of those whose land was defiled by the building of the hotel is worth considering. The Overlook was King's examination of the horror trope of the bad place, much like Shirley Jackson's Hill House, a place where tragedies just mount. And if that was the location's first tragedy, it might be represented in the scene. It doesn't make the film about that, though, any more than it's about Horace Derwent, a multimillionaire who once owned the hotel and who makes a brief appearance in Kubrick's film, along with his gay lover, Roger, who came to the ball in a dog costume. Uh, that's who this guy is. Unfortunately, Blakemore starts going off the rails into faulty pattern recognition with speculation such as the poster that came out in Europe said the wave of terror that swept across America and I remember looking at it, I said, the wave of terror that swept across America what's he talking about the impact of the movie that had just opened over there maybe Yes, that's what all ads do. Promote the product as outstanding, even if the initial response was mixed. From here, he really goes off the deep end by stressing the use of these cans of Calumet baking powder, suggesting that the name, which translates to Peace Pipe, is implying deception in this conversation because the name isn't seen in its entirety on the cans. It's a longish word on a round container. What do you expect? You don't see the name Tang in full either. Look, here's a can of Calumet in the film Zodiac, also about a murderer. Is that about the genocide of the natives too? Also, here's a can of Calumet in Jason's kitchen in Friday the 13th, the remake. No doubt tying back to this scene in the original film. Or not. Kubrick's assistant, Leon Vitale, said he found cans of Calumet in hotel pantries across the country when he was doing set research. It was just a popular product at the time. And it only gets worse from there. I don't see what the fuss is about. Just watch. Jeffrey Cox believes the film is an allegory for the Holocaust, based almost entirely on the appearance of the number 42, implying 1942 and the final solution, and the fact that Jack's typewriter is an Adler, a German brand. I have a message for Germany. Apparently your country will forever be synonymous with the worst thing it ever did. Sorry about that. I say the name as a reference to Irene Adler, the only woman Sherlock Holmes ever respected. Jack dotes on the typewriter, but hates his real wife. He and Holmes were both addicts. Jack was an alcoholic, and Holmes did cocaine. You do know what you're drinking is meant for eye surgery. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, but no work made Holmes a dull boy, which is backwards, but one of the other commentators says you're supposed to watch the film backwards, and therefore it still counts, and clearly this is the Hound of the Baskervilles. There. Solved. See how easy this is? If you want to see a film where a writer has a weird relationship with his typewriter, try Naked Lunch. Where the multitudinous internet breakdowns of that film? That one's actually weird. 
Also, apropos of nothing, he suggests more silly inferences regarding continuity breaks, claiming a disappearing sticker of Dopey of the Seven Dwarves is an actual comment on Danny wising up after his first vision. I think what Kubrick is saying is that before, Danny had no idea about the world. And now, he knows. He's no longer a dope about things. Well, thank God, Danny is no longer dopey. Though he is apparently still goofy, so take the significance of that observation with a big bucket of salt. As for the 42 on, uh, God, just numerological bullshit is so fucking stupid. Uh, yes, there's a 42 on Danny's shirt, but where else? If you multiply the numbers two, three, and seven, you get 42. Are you really retarded? Who said to multiply them? Well, what if you add them? Then you get 12, which is 21 backwards, because you're allowed to reverse things because I said so, which is half of 1921, which is when the ball took place. Christ, I just blew my own mind. And then there's the cars. And it's within a larger context that Kubrick uses involving numbers. Are you out of your <laughs> fucking mind? Yes, there's 42 cars if you don't count the snowcat, and if you wait until this point in the shot, because if you start earlier, you see several more cars over here to throw the count way off. I can't believe you're not really retarded. And does it even need to be said that Kubrick himself didn't even shoot this? He'd have probably thought to frame the helicopter blades out of the shot, but he was shooting the bulk of the film in Elstree Studios in England, while a small second unit crew filmed this in Oregon. Oregon! Maybe Kubrick included the number 42 the one time he actually did because it's the answer. The answer to what? Life, the universe, everything. One man who does not have the answer is Jay Weidner, who believes the film is Kubrick subtextually admitting his guilt over... Oh, God, I need a drink. Mm. Having faked the moon landing footage. We never went to the moon! We never kicked the moon dust! We never stabbed our heavenly dirt with a flag. We never went to the moon. Give me another one, Lloyd. If you're not too busy. Listen, busy at all. He thinks this rant Jack is having is meant to reflect Kubrick's internal struggles over his obligation to keep silent. Or shit. But I guess Stephen King must have helped fake the moon landing because this is in the book too. Have you ever had a single moment's thought about my responsibility? And when he's not insulting the space program, he's totally got sex on the brain, implying the film is full of sexual references added subliminally. A word he clearly doesn't understand as subliminal means below the threshold of perception, i.e. you couldn't see or hear it. He cites examples like Ullman greeting Jack and moving next to the filing tray, implying it looks like Ullman has, well, uh, a big... Willie. Yeah. What's that? Though he totally glosses over the fact that mere seconds later in the same scene, Ullman's secretary also looks to be sporting uh, the huge... Uh... Wiener? Any of you kids want another wiener? He then cites the woman in the tub, which is about the least subliminal thing ever. He asked Lloyd, he's got more sense. Thank you for saying so. I always liked you, Lloyd. Best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. Or Portland, Oregon for that. Oregon! Oregon. That's right. I almost forgot. The Timberline Lodge asked Kubrick to change the number of the hotel's most haunted room from 217 to 237 because they were afraid that guests would be afraid to rent room 217, whereas they had no room 237. This has long been understood as the reason for the change, but according to Mr. Weidner... This is the best part. Oh, that's actually not true. If you call the Mount Hood Resort and you ask for room 217, you will find there is no such room. That's a big fucking lie. See, this is what comes from not checking up on easily checkable facts. Because I did contact the Timberline Lodge and received the following email. Thank you for your interest in Timberline Lodge. The exterior of the building and the snowcat ride were used in The Shining. We have a room 217. It is just a standard room with two beds. We do not have a 237. People often ask for room 237. Which tells us two things. One, the hotel probably would have done better business had they not changed the number. And two, Mr. Weidner is so unsure of his own loopy notions that he has to blatantly fabricate evidence in order to prop them up. So why does he think or pretend to think the number was actually changed? The mean distance of the 
moon from the Earth is exactly 237,000 miles. Oh, shit! Sorry, the mean distance is over 238,000 miles, very nearly 239,000 miles. He tries to avoid going full conspiracy wacko by claiming... No, I'm not saying that we didn't go to the moon. That's the only thing you've said that's the truth. We're just saying that what we saw was faked. This actually makes it worse. So we went to the moon for real, but just didn't film anything while we were there. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb. And for the coup de gras, he tells us, There's a key in the lock, and on the key are is the words room and then the word N-O, which is an old uh, acronym for number. So it is not an acronym, it's an abbreviation. Except that the only capital letters on the key are R-O-O-M and then the N from the acronym. N. Not an acronym. English, motherfucker, do you speak it? There's only two words that you can come up with that have those letters in them, and that's moon and room. Please, Mr. Weidner, accept my invitation for a high-stakes game of Scrabble, because you can also make on, or, nor, rom, more, mono, morn, norm, and my personal favorite, moron, the only word that uses all the letters. Maybe Kubrick was onto something. Exactly. An imbecile. Yeah. Not the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. Another thing which uh, my film Kubrick's Odyssey really reveals, the patterns in the carpeting uh, exactly match launch pad 39A. Um, you know, even the driveway and everything. Very impressive until you look it up and see that it actually looks like this. It's one pad, not a networked array of them. Comparing what's really there to the carpet would look like this. I eat nothing. Hell, this guy's damn face could look like the carpet pattern if I deliberately tile it the way he did. I wonder how many other intentional misleads could be found if I delved into his personal expose on the shinning. You mean shining. Shh. You want to get sued? If you take nothing else away from this video, please internalize this. This is the title of the film in King's book. This is the title of the Simpsons parody version. Learn it. Know it. Live it. We come to Julie Kern's interpretation, and to be completely honest, I actually feel kind of bad about eviscerating this one because I honestly feel like the idea does have some merit. She views the story as an allegory for the myth of the Minotaur, and I can see that making some sense. After all, there is a labyrinth in the film that wasn't in the book. And we could see Jack as the Minotaur, Danny as Theseus, and Wendy as Ariadne, who teaches Theseus how to navigate the labyrinth. Unfortunately, her argument touches on none of this. She barely references the hedge maze, and Instead, focusing more on the fact that the sets of the hotel don't line up perfectly, which they often don't. Interior sets are often a bit larger than exteriors of same to give room for the crew and equipment. There's also no reason for a set to conform to the logic of an actual entire building. This dream sequence from Buffy the Vampire Slayer showed a character running from location to location in one take, made possible by the fact that the sets were actually all already set up this way on a single soundstage. And while identifying Jack as the villainous Minotaur, she does so by focusing on weird interpretations, such as suggesting that he looks like a bull in the scene, even as she acknowledges that Kubrick often framed antagonists in this way to convey menace. And then there's the poster in the games room. I realize that's not a skier. That's a, that's a minotaur. What the fuck? Yes, a minotaur with skis, ski poles, and the words ski monarch clearly visible. You have monarch on the bottom, which, uh, you know, keys in with royalty. Maybe it's a reference to the monster monitoring organization caring for Mothra. That must be why the twins are in this film. Mothra, yeah, Mothra. Or maybe it's a mountain in Colorado with a ski resort, as noted on this remarkably similar advertisement for numerous ski resorts in Colorado. Jesus, people, get out of your own heads occasionally and try looking shit up. You find interesting stuff, like the fact that at the base of the mountain there's a Sidewinder saloon. Maybe King got the name of his fictional town of Sidewinder from there. Who knows? Bringing up the rear is John Fell Ryan, whose idea is based almost entirely on an internet conspiracy theorist called the Merchermern. Oh, here comes an avalanche of bullshit. He of the self-aggrandizing name didn't want to appear in this film, but John's here to tell us all about what the Merchermern has kicking around in his mern, which is the aforementioned notion of watching the film backwards in a section with the astoundingly arrogant title, How the Shining Was Meant to Be Seen. 
Unless a film is tampered with by the studio, which this one wasn't, the director releases the film the way he meant it to be seen, not in some fan-mangled manner which damn near no one could have managed to contrive at the time the film came out. John thinks there's some value in projecting the film backwards on top of itself while on a mega dose of shrooms. He didn't actually say that last bit, but nothing else makes this idea make any sense at all. I just cannot believe any of this voodoo bullshit. So his car, his name, and his photograph all line up for one second. Except that's not even true. You get a shot of the car with the end credits ghosted over it. I guess we're supposed to chop the credits off before doing this. Sadly, Kubrick didn't leave an instruction manual behind for how to mutilate his work. You know, there's some fun jokes, but then there's serious stuff. No, they're not jokes. Kubrick didn't do this. You did this using Kubrick's film as raw material based on guidelines you made up. It was almost like I had to sort of fool my mind into believing that it wasn't retarded. But while doing my own version, I did notice some interesting things, such as the fact that the framing of the shots frequently line up quite cleanly. So I tried doing this with shots from across his work. See, this is the genius of Kubrick. The precision, the shot design, lens choice, the dedication it takes to get this shot of Dave Bowman to line up perfectly with this later shot of Dave Bowman as an old man. He was a master technician, not the Riddler. I mean, if the man was such a genius director, why would he purposely fill his films with all sorts of shots that the average non-fanatical viewer are going to think are mistakes? But somehow, this one film of his managed to turn into one long, intricate Rorschach blot revealing what those trying to puzzle it out are already interested in. Jeffrey Cox has written multiple books on Germany, so he sees the Holocaust. Bill Blakemore reported on war zones, so he sees a genocide. Jay Widener thinks the moon landing was faked, along with a bunch of other nonsense, so that's what he sees. After 103 minutes, we know a good deal about the contributors, but what have we really learned about the film itself? Nothing. There ain't nothing in room 237. And honestly, that's a shame because there are some genuinely odd things to be found in The Shining that could have benefited from a close examination instead of a series of analyses that were entirely focused on ignoring the actual plot as much as humanly possible. Ah! So what's the film really about? I want answers now or I want them eventually! It's underlying story of a father's hate for his child and his wife. The murderous father is a very, very frightening one. I mean, she only wrote the damn thing. What does she know, right? Though that does seem to fit with exactly what happens in the film. It's right there in your face. The film is about domestic violence and trying to make it about something else just cheapens its impact. I mean, yes, events like the Holocaust or native genocide may be larger, but there are also events in the past that don't really impact on our daily lives. The horror of The Shining is that it's such a banal, commonplace horror, it could actually happen to you. Wendy, I'm home. Horror is across the dinner table, across the breakfast table. Actually, horror is in the family, can be, and often is. And that's what The Shining is about. But what about the odd, unexplained details? The most famous of these is, of course, the final shot of Jack pictured in a ball from 1921. Directors will often do something like this at the close. What does that origami unicorn imply? Is that top going to fall over or not? These are questions deliberately left without a concrete answer, something the filmmaker wants us to leave the film mulling over in our heads. Kubrick himself suggested it could imply Jack was a reincarnation of the man in the photo, and that does fit with numerous hints given elsewhere in the film. It was as though I'd been here before. You've always been the caretaker. If that's the idea here, then it could go a good ways towards explaining one of the film's other mysteries, the two Grady's. At the beginning, we're told of a past caretaker who had killed his family over the winter. Charles Grady. But later, Jack meets a man slash ghost named Delbert Grady, who seems to have the same personal history. I have a wife and uh, two daughters, sir. In this case, the old standby trick of checking the book doesn't help. In King's book, the character is only ever known as Delbert Grady. It also makes no reference to the photograph, so maybe it's an extension of the same idea. Maybe Charles Grady was a reborn Delbert Grady who had lived in the 1920s and whose past actions may have influenced his later incarnation. It's all very tidy, but there is another possibility. I know you're going to hate me for saying it about dear old Stanley, but maybe it was a mistake. Well, an early plot outline for the film version has yet another name for the character, Daniel Grady. For whatever reason, Kubrick seemed intent on changing the character's name, but it's possible he slipped up later on, because there's another change that occurs in the bathroom scene. I'm intrigued. 
Jack was told about Grady by Mr. Ullman during his interview, but upon meeting him, Jack says instead, I saw your picture in the newspapers. This is doubtless a reference to the scene in which Jack finds an old scrapbook of press clippings about the Overlook, an event that happened in the book and which was scripted and filmed for the movie as well before being deleted from the final cut. The bathroom scene was doubtless written before Kubrick decided to cut the scrapbook scene, but much like the Goonies and the Octopus, the Octopus was more scary. The reference to the ultimately deleted scene remained. There's something else notable about the scene. It's almost word for word from the novel, in a film which made many changes from its source material this scene stands out as one case where what King wrote was deemed just fine by the screenwriters and hardly changed at all, including the now first appearance of the name Delbert in the script. King's original name for the character may have crept back into the film for the act of virtually transcribing a couple of scenes right out of the book, with either Kubrick or Johnson forgetting to alter it before handing out the pages. Jack Nicholson was apparently so annoyed by the constant rewrites that he eventually stopped bothering to read them until they were about to film, in case they got changed yet again. He says, I'll put on my suit and suit No, I think that line is right. In a time when all scripts were physically typed up and couldn't be changed with some simple digital edits, it's not remotely hard to see how such mistakes could happen, especially on a production that had dragged on for over a year of shooting. But that still does leave a few other discrepancies to account for, such as the matter of how long has Jack been sober? The first half of Jack's initial conversation with Lloyd is also very similar to the book's version, but the second half is altogether different and presents a few problems. Near the start of the film, Wendy tells Danny's doctor that Jack hasn't had any alcohol in the five months. However, the later conversation with Lloyd still has Jack referring to his five miserable months on the wagon. Despite the one month later title card that occurs in between, it really should be six months at this point. However, I don't think this is really much in the way of an issue. People misremember time frames constantly. It could be either a writing mistake or a simple character error. On the other hand, Jack's subsequent claim in the same conversation that the incident wherein he hurt Danny, which caused him to climb on the wagon to begin with, had happened three goddamn years ago isn't so easily dismissed i mean that's a huge discrepancy can't really be attributed to faulty memory especially since he's now misremembering a much longer time frame as opposed to his original shorter than accurate time frame so what's the deal here is the idea that jack has come unglued from his own time and is no longer sure when things are happening i mean it could tie into the reincarnation notion but it's not a very satisfying explanation uh, largely because nothing else in the film actually seems to suggest this. Could the two events have been separated by such a gap in time? If Jack injured his son three years ago and then promised six months ago to stop drinking, it doesn't really feel as though the one was really the motivation for the other. It really does seem like a mistake, but if so, it was a pretty... <laughs> oh, God damn blood! I told you to take the stairs! Um... All right, so how might such a discrepancy have occurred? Uh, it appears to be a mix-up between the book and the movie that probably got confused in the frequent rewrites. Danny is generally understood to be five years old. However, in the novel, Danny was only three when the incident with his arm occurred, and it also wasn't the event that caused Jack to finally hop on the wagon, which was a car accident that happened shortly thereafter. In the book, Jack asked Lloyd for one martini for each month he's been sober, which turns out to have been 20, not five or six. Jack's later outburst is more in line with the novel's timeline, and an early treatment for the film also gives Danny's age as being three when the event occurred though it doesn't specify the duration of Jack's sobriety. Now, those who passed first grade arithmetic have probably already noticed a problem here in that two years is one year less than three years, which is the time frame that Jack gives. However, it's notable that the movie never actually tells us Danny's age, unlike the book. And actor Danny Lloyd was actually six years old when the film was produced. If Kubrick was going off the actor's age for the character's age, then suddenly the disparity disappears. Now, while the long-belated sequel would eventually confirm that Danny was meant to have been five in the film continuity as well. He died when I was five. Obviously, this would not have been a factor for Kubrick, who was making his movie over three decades before the book was even written. Which raises an interesting point. Does the presence of a sequel actually negate some of these theories? Uh, Stephen King's sequel novel, Dr. Sleep, made into a movie by Mike Flanagan, totally makes some of these crazier theories impossible. Yes, there are ghosts. No, Wendy wasn't the real abuser. No, it couldn't have all been in Jack's head. 
Dr. Sleep could also be seen as giving us a different interpretation of that famous photo, implying that Jack was absorbed into the hotel, becoming part of its menagerie of ghosts. Like Grady before him, he no longer seems to recall who he is, though he does seem very much to be the same man with the same issues. But whichever way you read it, the underlying theme is the same, that of a man struggling with his own internal demons. So tell me, Bob. Are you going to take your medicine? There's a strange aversion many people have to real-world explanations as opposed to in-story explanations, but the fact is making something like a major motion picture is really hard, and the fact that there's still imperfections lurking inside them doesn't make them unworthy of our respect. Even Fincher doesn't always get it right. But some film fans would rather ignore a practical explanation if it means they can continue to fill the empty spaces with their own personal interests. And at some point, you just have to admit that you're not really down the rabbit hole at all. And you just have your head shoved several feet up your own ass. You know, I get it. People are just looking for a way to fill the holes. But they want the holes. They want to live in the holes. And they go nuts when someone else pours dirt in their holes. Hey. I could propose a theory that the whole movie is actually a dream Alex has while in a coma after leaping out of a window in a clockwork orange after uttering the phrase, forever and ever and ever. Look, his dad is played by the same actor as, well, what's his name, Grady, hence the reason for the dream version to be so hostile to his own children. I could probably even convince someone of that, but that doesn't make it true. Climb out of your holes, people! Those holes may soon be filled by this elephant choker of a book from Tashin, co-authored by director Lee Unkrich and the late great J.W. Rensler. Which is doubtlessly the greatest resource in the film ever compiled, though at a current price of 1500 bucks is unlikely to find its way into most collections. Its contents will doubtlessly leak out onto the internet, though, and what's already been revealed shed some interesting light on this semi-mythical production. No, not every detail was planned in advance and executed flawlessly. That legendary, world record-setting take count for the stair scene never happened. The shot logs show no more than 15 takes for any shot, exceeded only by this scene, which clocked in at a still impressive 66 takes. And on a related subject, the story that Kubrick drove Shelley Duvall to a nervous breakdown also suffered from being severely exaggerated every time it was repeated until the truth no longer came through. Who debunked that one? Shelley Duvall, in a new interview conducted for the book, where she admitted that Kubrick was tough on her, but also expressed her admiration and affection for him, which, funnily enough, she also did way back when the film was being made. I find I really respect him and really like him. Both as a person and as a director, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. And the saddest thing is that all of this overblown analysis is geared towards trying to find a great film hidden inside an already great film. Let's be honest with ourselves, The Shining has not endured as a horror classic for over four decades because of hidden ciphers or convoluted subtext. It has great performances, great cinematography, great locations, it's totally character driven, doesn't rely on jump scares, and its scariest scenes all happen with all the lights on, even in scenes that take place outside at night. Very few directors even try to accomplish such a feat. And it's not as if Kubrick didn't include some things in the film that aren't strictly literal, such as the point of view shot where Jack is staring down at the maze miniature. Not only do we see Wendy and Danny moving about at center, but the maze is astoundingly huge in this shot, far bigger than it's supposed to be. He seemed enamored with the notion of human figures dwarfed by their environment, looking tiny and helpless against an outsized backdrop, which is probably why his cavernous interior sets were far in excess of what the Timberline Lodge could have actually contained. It's also true that The Shining doesn't tell us everything. I personally always felt that Jack's claim that, as far as my wife is concerned, uh, I'm sure she'll be absolutely fascinated when I tell her about it. She's a uh, confirmed ghost story and horror film addict. Was a total lie. This woman is a horror film addict? Jack is just assuaging Ullman's concerns because he needs the job. In fact, there's nothing in the film to suggest that Jack actually even told her about the previous tragedy. She never brings it up a single time, either with Jack or any of the staff. And you really feel like that subject might have been broached at some point. But it's not. Not even after Jack's nightmare. I cut you up into little pieces. 
It's also true that Kubrick would include little bits of metatextual commentary in his films, but unlike some of the crazier suggestions made in Room 237, he didn't expect you to have a computer so you could zoom in on a magazine and then look up that particular issue to find a particular story within. He played fair with the audience. We totally have time to see this newspaper headline in Eyes Wide Shut, for example. The problem arises when a director does include little symbols and clues and bits of subtext here and there, and then audiences assume that everything the director did was for similar purpose. Jack's pose in the final picture looks like Baphomet. What does that mean? It means it was a stock photo they just put Nicholson's face on. Jack quotes the three little pigs. Not by the hair on your chinny chin chin. Is that a reference to a racist depiction of the wolf as Jewish in an old cartoon tying into the Holocaust hypothesis? No, it's a reference to the book. Speaking of books, maybe this red book on Ullman's desk explains everything because it's written by Carl Jung and was published posthumously 29 years after The Shining came out. At least this guy had the decency to admit his error. If you really want to get depressed, check out the comments under that retraction video where half the people are basically trying to tell him that he was right the first time around even though that's impossible. Others have gone so far as to suggest that Kubrick himself was lying in various interviews just to keep their own suppositions alive. This is pure unreason, constructing a path to the answer you've already picked. But what did our old friend Sherlock Holmes have to say about that? It's a huge mistake to theorize before one has data. Inevitably, one begins to twist facts to shoot theories instead of theories to shoot facts. Over four decades hence, and people are still asking, will we ever understand it all? And I submit to you that the answer is yes, once you stop making a concerted effort not to. Fortunately, as soon as this video goes online, this will all be over. This decades-long wave of apophenia will at long last be laid to rest. Hello, Matt. Come debate with us. Forever and ever and ever. Jesus Christ, this video took forever. I never thought I'd finish this damn thing. I gotta do something simpler next time. <laughs>